Hi everybody, welcome to this webinar on deep learning. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions pane in the control panel and I will answer them at the end. A copy of today's slide can be found in the handout tab on the control panel as well and you will receive a copy of the recording in a follow-up email after the event. Let's get started with deep learning. So what are we going to cover? Um, we're going to look at uh, deep learning theory. So don't be scared. It's not going to be too extreme. Uh, there's going to be just a little bit of math, the minimum amount to understand what's really happening. But uh, this is really uh, this is really a light introduction to deep learning theory. We're going to talk about neurons and neural networks and the training process and back propagation, that uh, mysterious algo. We're going to talk about optimizers and how they help actually learn. And then we'll start uh, looking at common neural network architectures and use cases, and I will run a bunch of demos. Um, we'll talk about convolutional neural networks for uh, computer vision, and I'll talk a little bit about recurrent neural networks, which are heavily used in uh, natural language processing. Uh, LSTMs are uh, um, a common uh, architecture for uh, recurrent neural networks and we'll end with the crazy GANs and uh, these are pretty fun and of course I'll share some resources okay let's get started and once again if you have questions please please ask all your questions okay so here we go with theory so first of all I guess we should explain what a neuron is so we're trying to mimic the biological neuron and what we know about biological neurons is that they have inputs okay uh, that are uh, assigned a weight and if inputs are uh, strong enough then the neuron fires if inputs are not strong enough the neuron doesn't fire okay so we're trying to mimic that using code so we have uh, a number of input signals okay x1 x2 etc each input has a weight w1 w2 and so on and then we have uh, a summing operation that will basically multiply each input by its weight and just add uh, everything together and this operation is called multiply and accumulate okay so uh, x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2 plus x3 times w3 etc etc okay and that gives us uh, a function uh, and that gives us a value we call u okay um, in most networks we also use a bias value but uh, for the sake of simplicity I will ignore bias the bias is just a fixed value that is also added to the multiply and accumulate operation so that u value is uh, is a linear function of uh, inputs right so if inputs vary linearly then u uh, will vary linearly and that's a problem because um, we want to have a threshold okay um, we want to mimic biological neurons and again sometimes they fire and sometimes they don't so there seems to be some kind of threshold um, beyond which something happens so to reproduce that we use activation functions and uh, over time a number of activation functions have been designed and the popular one these days is the last one here called ReLU rectified linear unit which is very simple, very easy, and very fast to implement. If u is negative, then um, the activation of u is zero. If u is positive, then the activation of u is u. Okay, so that gives us this threshold, and that also gives us potentially very large activations. So uh, there's no uh, limit to activation values unlike other functions like uh, tan h or uh, arc tan that you can see above that tend to uh, uh, be limited between uh, fixed values okay so this is a desirable property for for learning so that's a neuron a combination of multiply and accumulate and activation function all right and that gives us the output value of the neuron which we call the activation value all right okay so of course a neuron by itself is not going to do much uh, and we want to put them together in layers and networks so this is possibly the simplest neural network you could build 
Uh, this is called the fully connected network, and I'm sure you understand why, because each input is fully connected to all uh, intermediate neurons, and each intermediate neuron is fully connected to all outputs. Okay, so hence the name. Um, the input layer is um, the data we're going to uh, um, uh, send to the network for prediction, and the outputs are the results. Okay, and in the middle we have uh, the secret sauce. Okay, we have the uh, the layers that will actually learn the right uh, parameters to correctly predict uh, inputs to outputs. Okay, and these are called hidden layers. And uh, well, you need to have only uh, you need to have at least one. Okay, so uh, again, this is possibly the simplest uh, network you can build. So how do we actually uh, go from uh, input to output? Well, of course, first we need data. So let's imagine we have a data set and we put that uh, data set in a matrix. Uh, let's call it X. Okay, and each line here in the matrix represents a sample. Okay, and each column represents the features. Okay, so X11 is the first feature of the first sample. X12 is the second feature of the first sample etc etc okay x to one is the first feature of the second sample and so on okay so lines are samples and columns are features okay so obviously we need to have as many neurons on the input layer as we have features okay so sizing the input layer is very easy you need to have uh, the same amount of uh, neurons as you have features okay so that's l that number L here, okay? All right, so that's our matrix. Uh, now, um, most deep learning uh, is used for supervised learning problems, okay? And that means we need to have labels, okay? We need to know uh, what the proper label is for uh, a given sample. So we're going to store our labels in another matrix called Y, okay? So in, in this example, X1 is labeled with a 2. Okay, let's say this is a classification problem, and maybe we're trying to classify samples into uh, 10 different categories. Okay, so X1 is class 2, X2 is class 0, and the last sample here is class 4. Okay, so samples, labels, all right? If you've done machine learning before, you know when we work with categories, we don't like to work with uh, integers. Uh, we like to use uh, one hot encoded vectors. Okay, and if you've never seen before, it might, it might sound a little complicated, but it's not. So if, uh, if you represent categories as integers, then the model might uh, learn by mistake that category four is twice category two because there's a sense of scale in that uh, in those numbers which doesn't really exist right category two is not half of category four it's just a different number so it, to avoid those uh, scaling problems uh, we replace integer category integers with one hot encoded vectors so basically if we have 10 different categories here we're going to replace each category with a vector of 10 bits and we're going to set to one the bit that corresponds to the right category. So this is category two, so the bit zero, one, two is set. This is category zero, so bit one is set. This is category four, so bit zero, one, two, three, four is set, okay? It's called one hot encoding and this is how you get rid of uh, categorical variables. And this is a much more powerful way to represent things because it tells us how many dimensions we have to the problem, okay? So we need to train this network on uh, figuring out 10 different classes, okay? So, um, well, this also helps us size the output layer because if we have 10 classes here, then we're gonna need 10 output neurons, okay? So hopefully they will contain one or zero. Uh, we'll see about that, okay? And uh, that's, the, that's the basic theory, okay? So data samples here, labels here, and we want to encode them. Um, the benefit of this is we could actually see those zeros and ones as probabilities, right? 
So we know for sure that um, x1 is category 2. So if you see each bit here as a probability, then you know 100% that this is category 2 and 0% for all other classes. Okay, same here. You know the chance that the last sample is category 4 is 100% and 0% for all categories. So we'll see how this helps us. All right. Okay, let's move on. So the way this works is we are going to take a sample and if everything works fine, then when you put the features for the first sample on each neuron of the input layer and you run the multiply and accumulate operations and you run uh, the activation functions, at the end, um, in the output layer, you will have zeros in all output neurons except for the neuron corresponding to the right category. Okay, so that's the ideal scenario. Um, and again, we'll see this is not uh, exactly the way it works, but this is the this is where we're trying to get. And how do we know we're doing a good job? Well, we measure accuracy, which is the total number of correct predictions divided by the total number of predictions. Okay, so ideally we have 100% accuracy, but again, there is no such thing as 100%. And uh, it's going to take a bit of work to get there. Okay, so this is the perfect scenario. Now let's look at real life. So initially, of course, the network is not going to predict correctly because all those weights, right? Remember, each of these arrows is assigned a certain weight. All of these are um, initialized at random, okay? Uh, when you first uh, build a network, okay? And the purpose of the training process will be to figure out what those weights should be for maximum accuracy, but initially they're all random, so you're not going to predict right. So if you uh, try and uh, uh, push one sample, you know, you're going to get garbage on the output layer, random stuff, okay? But that's okay. Um, so we're not, we're not going to get that nice uh, vector with zero and ones. We're going to get something else. So let's call it uh, Y prime one, okay? Um, and when I say it's okay, it's because you have to start somewhere. So as long as we're able to measure the difference between the real label, so the real vector with zero and ones, um, and the, um, the predicted one, then uh, we're going to be able to improve. So to measure the distance between those two vectors, we need a loss function. And a loss function is really uh, a mathematical function that's going to compute a numerical error from those two vectors okay so don't worry too much about those all the nice frameworks tensorflow etc already include those loss functions so uh, unless you do uh, advanced stuff you don't need to write your loss functions okay so we can compute error for each individual sample but what we really want to do uh, and you'll understand why in a few minutes is we want to compute the cumulated error for a batch of samples okay we're going to run a few samples through the, the network, we're going to add up all the individual losses, and that gives us the batch error, okay? And then we're going to take um, uh, optimization decisions, all right? So in a nutshell, the purpose of the training process is to minimize prediction error, okay? Also called loss, by gradually adjusting weights, okay? And that's the intuition. If we tweak all the weights on these arrows in the right direction, then we should be able to minimize uh, over time the prediction error and hence uh, we should increase accuracy, right? Obviously, it's not an easy problem because we, for each of those weights, you know, we could either increase it or decrease it and we need to do this for all of them, right? So we're not going to flip a coin every time, we're going to use uh, an algorithm, okay? But more on this in a minute, okay? So this is what mini batch training is. So we start from the training set, we slice it in batches. A typical batch could be 32 samples or 128 samples. Um, we start with the first batch, we take each sample in the batch and we forward propagate it. So we do exactly what we saw on the previous slide. So we uh, put each sample um, in turn on the input layer, run, multiply, and accumulate, get to the output layer, uh, compute the loss for that um, 
sample and then we add up all the individual losses and we get the batch loss okay and then okay then we do the crazy stuff then we run this algo called back propagation so back propagation as the name implies is going to start from the output layer and go back through the network layer by layer and it will adjust weights uh, individually in the direction that we know reduces error okay so that's the uh, not flipping up coin part <laughs> we're gonna see this in a minute okay so back propagation can figure out that if you increase this weight a bit if you decrease this weight a bit and if you decrease this weight a bit then error will actually be reduced okay so it does that for each weight layer by layer and so the next time around okay when we propagate the next batch then hopefully um, we will have um, a lower loss right because we adjusted the weights you know in tiny uh, steps in the right direction and we and we back propagate again okay making the right decisions all the time and we do that batch after batch after batch and at the end we get to a train network okay so the mystery is how do we flip that coin <laughs> and win every time well okay hang, hang with me so a number of things are really important here so the batch size um, should be picked right uh, if you if you take small batches or if you take very large batches then your training process might not run very well the learning rate which guides how large those increments will uh, will be okay how large are the tiny updates that you make to the weights um, that's the learning rate uh, uh, driving that and the number of epochs okay so an epoch is going through the data set once batch by batch and it's typical to train for you know hundreds of epochs if you have large data sets and you train completely from scratch so these are hyper parameters and we'll we'll talk about those later when we look at the code okay but this is mini batch training so of course we need to know that we're doing a good job right so what ha also happens during the training process is at the end of each epoch we run another data set which is usually a fraction of the edge of the original data set that we kept on the side that we did not use for training we run this validation data set through the network in training and we measure accuracy and the idea here is um, the network has not been trained on that data so there's no bias here and we can measure how it does on this okay and if we see epoch after epoch validation accuracy improving then it means we are learning and we are generalizing to data that hasn't been used for training which is a good thing okay uh, it's also a good practice to keep another fraction of the original data set which is called a test set that you will only use at the end of the experimentation so when you're completely done tweaking and uh, and uh, and optimizing your network and you want to benchmark it against networks that you trained a week ago a month ago then uh, you use the test set okay and the idea here is that um, as the validation set is used uh, during uh, network development um, it's likely that you know you will eventually introduce some bias uh, on the uh, with the validation data set so the the accuracy with the valid validation data set is not enough because you you tend to make network design decisions based on validation accuracy that doesn't happen with test accuracy because you only do this at the very end when you're done okay so good practice to have those three data sets so how do we uh, magically know uh, how to adjust those weights well this is a well-known algo i'm sure you've heard the word uh, it's called sgd stochastic gradient descent it's a, it's an old algo and the intuition for this is imagine your um, imagine you're lost in the mountain and you can't see anything and you can only see just a little bit ahead of you or, or, or on the side so if you needed to get to the lowest point right get back to the valley um, you would just take a, you would just you know try to uh, identify 
where the steepest slope is, okay, which way is down. So with your foot, you would kind of uh, probe the ground immediately next to you and say, okay, well, this is going up, so I'm not going to go there. Oh, this is going down. Okay, so let's go down. And then you would do that again and again and again. Okay, so by taking tiny steps down the mountain, you would eventually get to the valley. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to do um, because imagine um, this, uh, this simple network only has two parameters, X and Y, and uh, F is our loss function. Okay, so uh, X and Y are weights. F is the loss function and Z is the loss. Okay, so the loss is a function of the network parameters. So we're trying to minimize loss. So we're trying to find the values of X and Y that yield the lowest Z. Okay, so that's exactly the same problem. Um, we're trying to, we start with random values of X and Y. So we start anywhere on that surface and we're trying to get to the lowest point, meaning we look for X and Y that give us the lowest Z, the lowest error. Okay, so that's what uh, deep learning optimi optimization is trying to find the parameters that minimize loss. So that's what SGD does, um, except it's not probing the ground with its foot, right, or its feet. Uh, it is using math to find which way is down, okay? And we'll get to that in a second. And the step size is based on the learning rate, which we saw just before, okay? So if you have a high learning rate, then you will be take big steps uh, and you can see why taking huge steps would not help in getting down to the valley. And if we have a super low learning rate, then you're going to take really tiny steps. And again, you could see it would take forever to get down to the valley. So you need to have a middle ground here. Okay. So how do we find which way is down? Okay. So this is the part you're not going to like. Uh, but hey, uh, it's important to understand. So um, I have to take you to uh, back to high school for a second. Uh, remember derivatives, okay? Derivatives point, uh, they give you the, the slope or the tangent uh, on any curve, okay? So if you're only one dimension and you compute the derivative in this point, then it gives you the slope of that tangent, right? Tangent line, okay? So you know uh, this is, if you move a little bit to the right, because the derivative here is negative, right? Uh, we have negative slope if we move to the right and we will have positive slope if we go to the left okay of course uh, we don't have just one dimension to our problems we have multiple dimensions so this is uh, uh, this is one uh, extra dimension imagine we're here okay and we want to go down then we could take the derivative with respect to this dimension which is uh, y okay so actually going left here is going to decrease um, the loss and we can take in in the same point we can say take the derivative with respect to x and again if we go right here uh, we're going to decrease loss so by computing derivatives in each dimension we know that if we take uh, in the x-axis if we take a step uh, right then we're good and uh, in the y dimension if we take a step uh, left then uh, we're also decreasing, okay? So that's how it works. And this is the bit you're really, really not gonna like. Uh, this generalizes to uh, an arbitrary number of dimensions. So even if we have a hundred or a thousand dimensions, we can compute partial derivatives in each dimension, okay? Uh, so we're not in high school anymore, I guess. Uh, this is more like college. Uh, and, uh, and if we put all those partial derivatives with, with respect to each dimension in a vector, well, this gives us a thing called the gradient. Okay, so the gradient uh, is, uh, in a given point, is the a vector of all the partial derivatives in all dimensions. Okay, and this is, well, this, this is why this thing is called stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so stay with me. This is as, as bad as it gets when it comes to math. If you're curious about how this works in practice, uh, I recommend this blog post where uh, this gentleman has built a complete end-to-end -end example on a very simple neural network computing all the partial derivatives. So, um, you know, if you're uh, 
if you can't sleep tonight uh, and uh, you know you have this thing in your head and you want to see how it really really works uh, well this is the best example that I found okay um, a number of weird things can also happen because of course the the loss function is not going to be nice and smooth just like in my uh, mountain example it's going to look uh, all kinds of weird and uh, we can have something like this where we have multiple valleys right so we have a, a global valley a global minimum here and we have local minima here and um, this keeps uh, deep learning researchers awake at night because they want to make sure they don't get stuck in those local minima right because again if you get all the way down there uh, it's going to be a minimum so all the derivatives will be zero and you're going to be trapped okay and this isn't good because the error here is higher than here so here is really where you want to be um, saddle points are also pretty bad saddle points are uh, they they are uh, they look like a horse saddle hence the name and they are um, a maximum in a certain dimension and a minimum in another dimension but again in this particular place all derivatives would be zero so it's kind of if you ended up here uh, then you know you would stop moving because all gradients will go to zero and then you wouldn't know where to go next uh, so there are plenty of weird things like that um, uh, in uh, the, the again the short story is yes those things do exist uh, in the loss uh, functions but they tend not to be a problem and uh, and I'll stop there. If you want to know more, there's a really good article which is quite readable by uh, Ian Goodfellow, which is one of the top deep learning researchers, and uh, and he explains how uh, and uh, how those things do exist, but you know uh, why they're not really a problem. Um, so we talked about SGD, but there's actually a whole bunch of uh, optimizers out there. Uh, SGD um, is uh, the, the granddaddy, but uh, it, it still works very well. It's uh, it's understood, uh, and uh, and it's uh, still uh, extremely effective. Okay, but other optimizers over time have been designed, and they have uh, really uh, exotic names like uh, Etagrad and Ada Delta and and a few more. And uh, again, uh, we could spend a few hours talking about that. And I actually wrote a bunch of blog posts on this if you're interested. But the key thing is um, SGD takes steps that are always the same size. So even if you have very steep slope uh, where probably you could take bigger steps and, and converge quicker to, uh, to a lower loss, uh, SGD won't do it. So that's why uh, adaptative optimizers have been designed. And this is the ADA stuff that you see here. ADA grad, ADA delta, ADAM is another one. And those... Uh, can literally speed up if slope is uh, very steep or slow down if slope is very shallow. And, um, and they can even use multiple, uh, different learning rates for different dimensions, right? Because again, uh, you could have very steep slope in one dimension and very uh, shallow slope in, uh, in another dimension, okay? Again, uh, if you're new to this, uh, start with SGD and you can read about the other ones later on. All right. Okay. So uh, if you're still with me, congratulations. You know a lot about deep learning and probably more than a lot of people who have deep learning in their job title. So let's sum things up. So what we should see is something like this. Over time, right, over epochs, we should see training accuracy go up. Okay. And in fact, given enough time and given a large enough uh, network, we will get to 100%. Okay. This is, uh, this is guaranteed. Um, and uh, is that a good thing? Well, not necessarily, as we'll see in a second. Um, accordingly, we should see the loss uh, going almost all the way down to zero, right? Loss decreasing is a good sign that your network is learning. If you plot validation accuracy, usually you'll see something like that, right? It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a little lower, but it's going to go up as well, and then it's going to plateau. And if you train long enough, it's going to drop and it won't recover okay and this is bad it's called overfitting and it means you train too hard you train so hard on your training set that the only thing you can predict is the training set so you you don't generalize anymore to uh, to other data so that's that's very bad you want to ignore that okay um, so you need to find that best epoch and there are a number of techniques uh, to do that 
uh, checkpointing, early stopping, etc. But you have to be careful about not uh, going into overfitting because that's a useless model. So uh, I love this definition by uh, Sebastian Ruder, another leading uh, researcher. Deep learning ultimately is about finding a minimum that generalizes well. Okay, remember we okay the training set is useful, but uh, at the end of the day, we uh, want to predict on real life data, so it needs to do well on that. And if we can, f and we have bonus points for finding a minimum that uh, uh, fast and reliably. Okay, because if we train fast, then you know we just get uh, to a good model quicker and uh, we save money and reliably because we need to train again and again. You're not going to train just once. You're going to train tens, hundreds of times. So you need to be able to do that uh, again and again. All right, uh, let's do a quick demo. So I'm going to show you um, a first simple example. Uh, this is based on the, uh, on the MNIST data set. And uh, well, I'm sure you've seen the MNIST data set before. It's um, uh, a collection of uh, 60,000 uh, digits. I should have a, a picture. Let me show you. Uh, where is my MNIST data set? Here it is. Okay, it looks something like this, right? Uh, so handwritten digits, 0 to 9. And these are black and white pictures, 28 pixels by 28 pixels. And so we can easily represent them as a matrix uh, of uh, pixels with pixel values between 0 and 255. Okay, 0 is white. And, oh, sorry, sorry um, 0 is uh, black and uh, 255 is white, okay? So I'm using uh, my favorite deep learning library here. I'm using Keras, uh, which is very, you know, beginner-friendly. So I, that's the one I recommend. Uh, okay, so just import uh, a bunch of uh, APIs here. Define the size of my images, the number of classes, okay? Uh, there's a, a nice API to download the data set already, okay? And I can print uh, that shape. So 60,000 samples, 28 by 28 pixels, okay? And if I try and print the first sample, well, then we see it looks like uh, a bunch of values between 0 and 255, okay? And again, 0 is black and uh, 255 is white. And of course, we have labels, okay? So 60,000 labels, and we have uh, that first sample is actually a five, right? So you wouldn't know by reading <laughs> this, but this is actually the picture of a five, okay? So I can, uh, I, I have to do very basic processing here. So first, I'm going to normalize pixel values. Uh, so move, shift them from the zero to 55 range to the zero one range to avoid, again, uh, scaling issues. Normalizing is, uh, is common practice. And of course, I need to one-hot encode uh, my labels because I see I have integer category numbers and that's not what I want. So um, I can use this two categorical function that will transform my integers to uh, one-hot encoded vectors. So this is category five and zero, one, two, Oh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so bit 5 is set to 1, which is right. And then I this is how I define my simple network. And uh, you can see, well, uh, it's a sequential network, and that's the fully connected network in Keras. Um, so first, I'm going to take my images, which are 2D images, right, 28 by 28, and I flatten them. So 28 by 28 is 784. Uh, so my input layer will be 784 neurons and each neuron will have a pixel value in it. Then I have a first fully connected layer with 512 neurons activated by the ReLU function and then a second uh, fully connected function, uh, network uh, layer, sorry, with 64 neurons and again activated by ReLU. And then I use the softmax function because I want those things to look like probabilities. So softmax is a simple function that takes a vector of uh, values and turn them into probabilities in the sense that uh, they're, they're all between zero and one and their sum is one, 
okay, which is what probabilities would look like, okay? So each output neuron, each of the 10 output neurons will have the probability uh, for each class. And then I compile my model. I use the ATOM optimizer. I use this predefined loss function, which is a fit for classification problems, and my metrics should be accuracy, okay? So I can see my model summary with the different layers. And then, then I just call train, passing my training set, my validation set, the batch size, the number of epochs, okay? So it trains for a little bit. Okay, and then I can score my model using my uh, validation set, uh, which is called uh, uh, test here. Uh, yeah, that's not great. It should be called validation. Sorry about that. And, uh, and I can see my validation accuracy is 98%, which is pretty good, right, for just a few seconds of training. So this simple neural network can successfully classify my uh, uh, MNIST images with 98% accuracy, okay? Um, but of course, I want to try it with real images. So what I've done is I've uh, uh, hand uh, designed <laughs> some some pixels here, right? So these are basically um, paintbrush uh, images that I've uh, built, okay? And some of them are really, really nasty. Uh, the nine, I think, is particularly ugly, yes. Okay, and... Uh, I'm going to try and load those, okay, so just load the image and uh, and send them to my network for prediction, okay. So loading each digit, pushing each uh, image through the model, and then looking at the result and checking if I uh, was uh, right or wrong. So we can see we get zero wrong, we misclassify zero as a two, so that's not that's not great. Uh, the other ones are fine, uh, and nine is a little low, okay? So uh, there is no such thing as a one. Um, these are zero, nine, 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 nine uh, values that are rounded to one, okay? But anyway, I can see I have a problem here. So let's see how we could actually fix that problem. All right, so um, one way to fix that problem is to use a different architecture, okay? And uh, these are convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks uh, account for uh, the fact that data is multidimensional. So you don't have to flatten data anymore. Uh, what you're gonna do is you're going to use this convolution operation that applies uh, a filter to the input image and extracts information okay so again in the interest of time i can't go through all the details but you will get the slides you can read all about it and uh, and you can ask me questions okay so convolution is a simple math operation that extracts information and here's an example so if we take this input image and apply this filter okay to the uh, to uh, those uh, three by three pixel blocks then we end up with this Okay, so you could say this filter is an edge detector. Okay, because if, if we knew what this weird beast is, then we would still know here. All the useless information has been removed and we only kept the interesting information, in this case, the, the edge. So you could say, well, how do we know these values are interesting? Well, uh, that's the whole point. So when you train a convolutional neural network, these are the values you will learn. So you will start with ra random filters and using backpropagation and the same mechanism we saw before, we're going to learn what those values should be, okay? And then uh, we shrink images using a pooling operation. So pooling is quite simple. You slice the image into, in this case, two by two blocks and you just keep the high uh, the highest value so for the red pixels we keep the six for the green pixels we keep the eight etc etc okay and the rationale for this is there's a whole bunch of useless information here right? all the black pixels here they tell us nothing the good stuff is the edge and these are the bright pixels so we could throw away all those uh, zero value pixels and still uh, be able to understand what this shape is right so that's the intuition between uh, behind pooling 
And so if you combine both, and this is a, a famous network called uh, Le Net by a French researcher, Yann Lequin, uh, who got a Turing Award last year. Uh, we start from um, an image, we apply different convolution filters, then we apply pooling to shrink those images, and then we apply more convolution, and then we shrink again. And then we have images that look nothing like the original image, but they still have the good stuff, right? So we flatten all these tiny images and these become a large vector and we use a fully connected network to classify those. Okay, so we have convolution blocks and then classification at the end. Okay, and this is uh, the, the basis of convolutional neural networks. Okay, so let's uh, look at a quick example. So here's the same data set okay uh, MNIST so doing exactly the same thing here but this time I'm building a convolutional neural network and this is very similar to LeNet okay convolution pooling convolution pooling flatten and then fully connected layers for classification okay so different architecture and we do the same thing we train blah 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 evaluate 99.16 accuracy without tweaking much so that's already higher and now if I try my ugly digits I can see you know I have very high probabilities for all digits and even my ugly nine is detected right okay so convolution networks are really the kings of uh, computer vision and in fact um, you can do very advanced things so uh, you can build classification models detection models segmentation models these are uh, real examples taken from a library called gluon uh, gluon cv for computer vision which is implemented on on, on top of mxnet and uh, the good thing is you can easily use those models because gluon cv includes pre-trained version that you can use out of the box okay so here i'm installing glue on cv and i'm loading a pre-trained model i'm using yolo v3 yolo means you only look once it's a single shot detector model okay it's been pre-trained already and it knows about those uh, uh, different classes here okay and so i'm just downloading it and then i'm grabbing an image from the web okay and this is my image here right and i'm passing that image through the pre-trained model and the output will be uh, class identifiers and scores and bounding boxes okay and if i plot those things right i can see you know the car the person the bicycle and the dog have been detected with very high probabilities and the only thing that I did is really download a pre-trained model and use it. Okay, so um, this is uh, this is what uh, Glue on CV lets you do. Uh, you can do other things like segmentation. Again, uh, I'm grabbing an image from the web. Okay, here it is. I'm uh, normalizing it uh, according to the training set. Okay, so I know these settings are the ones that uh, the training set. Uh, uh, went through for training so I need to apply them to the image as well and then I download another model for segmentation okay and once again all I do is push the image through the model okay get the outputs and I can see segmentation here okay so these are really really hard problems uh, and uh, those pre-trained models make it pretty easy to get right okay uh, and you can do plenty of other things uh, in painting right uh, so this is the training image and this is the predicted image so uh, so sorry this is the data sample and this is the predicted image so you train the model on literally filling in the blanks okay and that's a pretty cool application and I guess the state-of-the-art model is this model called detectron by uh, by Facebook uh, so um, I actually uh, have another video where I go through um, the notebook here. So I'm not going to go through that notebook because that takes too long. 
but uh, this is the kind of stuff you can do with uh, Detectron. You can actually uh, you can actually predict images and you can also process videos. So here it is, right? So how cool is that? Segmenting. Uh, this is a YouTube video. Uh, that is uh, uh, being processed by Detectron, and you can see segmentation here, and uh, and yeah, it's uh, it's pretty pretty wild, right? Uh, we can see traffic lights, and we see, can see those people on the bridge. Uh, we can even figure out those traffic lights way back there. So uh, well, again, this is based on convolution. This is a PyTorch model, and uh, and if you want to know more, then you can uh, just go through that uh, that blog post. Right and uh, uh, sorry, go through that video and uh, and run the notebook here. All right, okay. Uh, all right, a few more things. Um, so recurrent networks. So recurrent networks are important when when the order, uh, the sequence of uh, of your data matters. Okay. So um, so far we looked at fully connected or convolution, and you could predict images in any. Um, um, in any order and you would still get the same result but imagine you had to translate text right so imagine each sample here is a word uh, of course the order matters right so the prediction uh, for this word depends on this but it also depends on this right you need context so there are plenty of applications for RNNs uh, you could predict uh, 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 sequence to sequence with uh, uh, different sizes so image captioning, pass an image, get uh, a text sentence uh, describing the image or sentiment analysis, passing a uh, sequence of words and getting uh, a positive or negative or neutral sentiment, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Uh, so there are really, really lots of applications for RNNs. Um, one of the preferred way to train RNNs is uh, using LSTMs, which are crazy complicated so i'm not going to go through that neuron but in a nutshell um the the lstm neurons remembers the previous state okay so uh, they have short-term memory that's that's the name so they remember quote unquote uh predictions past predictions and uh, so you can apply that context uh, to long sequences of data and uh, and predict um, translations or other sequences okay there's a variation on LSTMs called uh, uh, GRUs uh, which are uh, easier to train and, and just as good okay so LSTMs for um, machine translation NLP in general natural language processing you'll find lots and lots of LSTMs okay all right and the last uh, thing I want to talk about is uh, GANs so GANs are a little bit crazy, right? Uh, here's an example. Do you recognize those people? Yes or no? Well, no, because they really don't exist. Uh, these images have been generated at the pixel level uh, by a GAN, and, uh, and they are super realistic, okay? So in the interest of time, I cannot explain how GANs work, so I'll refer you to those, uh, to those projects but um, this is the the basic idea here right uh, we look at celebrity faces and uh, celebrity data set and we learn how to generate uh, lookalikes right uh, people that look like the ones in the data set here's another example where you can train a model to uh, generate again uh, photorealistic pictures starting from this right which is called a semantic map okay uh, and uh, and this is another really really cool project okay and you can see how high quality this is this is a pytorch model um, more phase generation so that model on the left uh, actually allows you to control the features so a more beard or a, you know bigger smile or whatever uh, so it closes the loop and uh, this is uh, very impressive the model on the right uh, lets you apply the style of a source face to another face okay so uh, so if you apply 
um, if you apply this face to this kid, well, you get something like this, right? So how crazy is that? And they have a really cool video as well, so take a look at that. Uh, those are TensorFlow models. And the last one I want to point out is uh, uh, that Everybody Dance Now video. Again, I'm out of time, so I'm not going to play it, but uh, feel free to play it, where uh, we start from uh, a source video with a professional dancer. We detect the pose okay, of that dancer. And in, in real time, we can apply the pose of that professional dancer to anyone. Okay, so even geeks can dance now. And this is a hilarious video. I really, really recommend it. But again, this is based on GAN. So how do you get started with all of this? Uh, well, here are some resources. Um, you can go to the Machine Learning Academy on, uh, on AWS. Plenty of classes here. Uh, DeepLearning.ai is uh, uh, Andrew Zengi's course on deep learning, which is really great. Another really good one is uh, Fast AI by uh, Jeremy Howard. Uh, both are equally good, so uh, you could actually do both and learn uh, <laughs> twice as much. Uh, a couple of books. Um, um, this deep learning book is really math heavy, you have been warned. This one is uh, code heavy, so if you're more of a code and notebook person, I recommend the other one. Uh, Gluon and Keras are good starting points for, uh, for deep learning, and this is my GitLab repo where you'll find uh, the examples I showed you here, and many more. Okay, well, that's it for this session. Thank you very much. It was very dense. I'm sure you have plenty of questions, and I'm looking forward to answering them. Thank you very much.